Hello and good morning or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. I'm Aprajita Das, a third year PhD student at the Department of History at UC Berkeley. And it is my utmost pleasure to welcome you to this very exciting talk at the Institute for South Asia Studies at UC Berkeley by Dr. Sonia Vick, who's joining us from India. Before I introduce today's event and the speaker, a few housekeeping tips. We'll have the AV off for those who are not speaking, and we'll be using the chat box for any relevant links that are posted. We also encourage participants to keep their questions till the end of the talk. Anurag and I will get to them in a dedicated Q&A that follows. With that, I now very gladly introduce the speaker of the day, Sonia Vig, who has recently been awarded a doctorate at the Department of History, University of Exeter, uh, for her dissertation titled The Body of Words, Social Theory of Sex and the Body in Early Modern South Asia. Sonia will soon move to the greener Scottish pastures for a two-month postdoctoral fellowship at the Institute of Advanced Studies in Humanities, University of Edinburgh. This is exciting because Sonia's work very innovatively blends medical, erotological, poetic, and political texts from early modern South Asia to foreground vital questions of sexuality and sexual health. These are only now beginning to receive scholars' serious attention, especially for Mughal India. In asking how to write a cultural history of sex, Sonia's work pays rigorous attention to the tone and the structure of the early modern South Asian archives in various languages and genres. Honestly, it's really exciting to see a dedicated treatment of sexual health, anxieties of virility and impotency, as well as social codes around them in pre-colonial South Asia on their own terms. Thank you, Aprajita. My name is Anurag Advani, and I'm a sixth year PhD candidate in the Department of South and Southeast Asian Studies here at UC Berkeley. It is indeed a privilege for us to have Dr. Sonia Wig join us today. We are especially proud that she has chosen the Institute for South Asia Studies at UC Berkeley as a platform to share her new and exciting research. One of the world's leading institutes for research and programs on South Asia, the Institute for South Asia Studies at the University of California, Berkeley, works with faculty members, graduate students, community members, private institutions, and nonprofit organizations to deepen understanding of the region and to create new generations of scholars of South Asia. You can find more details by clicking on the link shared in the chat box. Berkeley is an emerging hub for South Asian history, especially in the early modern period. There is a growing cohort of graduate students and faculty at Berkeley studying political, economic, social, and artistic cultures in the Mughal and Maratha empires, the Deccan Sultanates, Bengal, Central India, the Afghan region, and beyond. Their projects bring to light a range of primary sources in Persian, Urdu, Hindavi, Marathi, Marwari, Bengali, Pashto, Prakrit, Sanskrit, Tamil, and Arabic, to name only a few languages. So it is really wonderful to have upcoming scholars like Sonia discussing their groundbreaking work with us. Sonia's talk today is titled Sexual or Social Maladies, Translating Sexual Medicine for Men in Early Modern North India. Her paper will look at sexual healing as a cultural act rather than a scientific medical tradition. It demonstrates how such acts shaped larger discourses around masculinity and codes of conduct in Persianate courtly culture. She puts into conversation a wide variety of Persian and Urdu texts, including works on Greco-Arabic or Yunani medicine, erotomedical medical manuals, poetic compilations, treatises of courtly conduct, biographies, legal compendia, dictionaries, and popular literature. 
So just to uh, a brief note to add that this talk is about sexuality, so it will include some explicit references. Without further ado, over to you, Sonia. Really looking forward to the talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for that extremely generous um, introduction. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank everyone at the Institute for South Asia Studies, especially Professor Sugato Ray, Professor Manas Paruki, uh, Punita Kala, Aprajita, and Anurag um, for this very generous invitation to share some of my work um, with you all today. Um, this paper stems from my doctoral thesis, um, and while I would absolutely appreciate questions as well as feedback, I hope that the conversation we have today sort of leads to um, larger conversations on the subject of the paper, as well as the sources and archives that I share with you today. Um, so I would like to um, begin today's paper with a story from the biographical account of a high ranking Mughal judicial official named Khwaja Dost Muhammad. Um, operating during the reign of the Mughal Emperor Jahangir in the early 17th century. Um, during his tenure, he adjudicated a very interesting case. A man came up to him and deposed that the wife of his brother had taken possession of his brother's property and picked up a child saying that he was his real son. Um, while the fact was that his brother was impotent and he says, Baradere man anin bud. And how can an impotent person produce a child? The said Khwaja then summoned the mother and the child and made inquiries. The woman accepted that there was certainly something deficient in the virility of her husband. Um, she said, the rajuliyate shohre man nuksani bud. Um, rajuliyate being the term to denote virility or even manliness. But a Hakim advised her to give her husband rohu fish with its head to eat for a period of 40 days without a break, which would make him virile and she did so accordingly. And by eating the fish, virility was restored to him and that a son was born of him. As khurdane mahi, rujuliyat barro ghalib gasht. While the story in its end is in itself very interesting, there are three issues that stand out here. First, it was possible to involve the courts and other judicial authorities in a case ascertaining charges of impotence of a man especially when the claims were so intimately connected with rightful inheritance. Texts such as the Fatwa -i Alam Giri, one of the largest compendia of Hanafi school of Islamic jurisprudence, discusses the pro procedure to establish impotency called the state of being anin um, and dissolution of marriage in detail, something that I can talk about more in the Q&A. Um, but in this case, the man did not even have to be alive. The charge of impotency was posthumously being made partially supported by the fact that he did not procreate with his wife in all the time that he was alive. Secondly, the check by the Khwaja uh, to ascertain the parentage of the child um, shows how judicial authorities could be utilizing quote unquote popular but very informed medical, medico culinary dietetic ideas to make legal decisions. As for the nature of the check itself, it involved ascertaining if the qualities of the medicine, in this case, the rohu fish, uh, were manifested in the resultant progeny, um, which would show that uh, the method that was used to restore the man's virility would be retained and be manifested in this child. Lastly, the woman's assertion that even though her husband had not been able to procreate when alive, she sought help from a Hakim or a physician who cured him by ordering a diet of rohu fish for 40 days straight. Now, as much as I do not envy that man's dinner, the physician here suggests uh, a course of regimentation of giza or diet as a method to restore virility. And it is this link between food, its ability to restore virility and strengthen an individual by correcting his humoral imbalances sometimes even the root cause of sexual dysfunction that forms the basis of my paper today. But then that begs the question, what do individual cases of cur curing impotency tell us about early modern state in South Asia? To answer that, one must move a little beyond the individual. Um, when envisioning the divinely ordained authority of Emperor Akbar to rule over the ever-expanding Mughal Empire, Abul Fazl, in his 16th century work, Aini Akbari, use the analogy 
of maintaining the health of the body politic and applying remedies to the several diseases thereof to explain how the emperor was imperative to maintain a vigorous and strong empire comparable even to the health of an animal in all cases animal individual and empire all the inner elements needed to be in sync with each other it is this intrinsic connection between health virility and masculinity in early modern south asian society that forms the second major premise of my paper today the trajectory of this connection then needs to be seen in context of changely courtly culture and notions of body politic under state patronage especially by the moguls the literature produced about these issues influenced not only varied medical practices but overall social attitudes in the 17th and 18th centuries in most of my texts there in most of my texts over often the ailing body was also the impotent body especially of a noble man early modern medical texts created specific notions about curing the sexually ailing body most of which contained practical medicaments with a fully fleshed out theoretical framework to explain and cure the ailment in my understanding then um sexual healing should be seen as representative of a cultural system rather than just being a scientific medical tradition so in today's paper by reading medical texts in conjunction with manuals of courtly conduct contemporary biographies dictionaries and other literary and other literature i will demonstrate how embodied experiences as well as individual sexual medical health was intrinsically linked not only with indo persian humoral theories but with larger ideas of virility and vigor especially masculine but first i must situate where all of this is happening the mughal empire was one of uh, three principal islamic empires of the early modern period the others being safavids in iran and ottomans in west asia and eastern europe the culture of the mughal court has often been labeled indo persian leading to intense amount of debate that i do not go into here and i i use the term for text produced in south asia and because it signifies a synthesis of ethnic uh, cultural and political elements from india iran and central asia as well as the use of persian as a pan indian court and elite cultural language while remaining aware of that wider global history i have chosen to focus on the heartlands of the mughal empire and their rajput allies some of the texts analyzed in today's paper were also written and circulated in the deccan sultanates which adjoined the territory of the moguls and was eventually engulfed by the latter in late 17th century i am mindful of the complex and often contradictory developments in south asia in this period and yet this paper's analysis is situated in the mughal court all the while borrowing from and commenting upon developments in the broader cultural political context of the persianate world including the many variations even within the indo persian sphere so let's turn towards what are these promised sources that i've been harping about one of the main source for this paper is part of the genre of yunani tibbia or medical texts uh, with its greco arabic tradition um the primary example that i will quote extensively in this paper today being the tibbi akbari or the medical knowledge of hakim mohammad akbar azani uh, it was composed in 1701 um the text is a general medical compendium which contains chapters on special diseases of men and women but the former being the one that i will quote here it's an early 18th century commentary on a 15th century persian translation of a 13th century arabic text now i can give all the details for those who would like it later um but arzani it's important because arzani provides rare biographical information about himself also in tib um especially about his father mir uh, haji mohammad mukim and about being a recluse in a convent where he studied religious and medical doctrines it is speculated um that he took part in the deccani military campaign under mughal emperor aurangzeb to to whom some of the copies of this text are dedicated the tibbi akbari copy used extensively in my paper belongs to the british library and is dated 1707 1708 he wrote azani wrote extensively composing several medical treatises and scholars like sima alvi have wonderfully explained his continued prominence in the 19th century the other major source base for this paper is lazatun nisa or the pleasures of women situated in the ilmul ba or knowledge of sex or sexual sciences we can talk about that as well category 
This text has an amazing history, a subject that I've discussed in detail in my doctoral thesis. Um, it builds on an older erotological tradition of Sanskrit folk shastras. Multiple versions of this text attributed to a range of authors have survived in collections that were later deposited in museums and archives around the world. The most prominent and the most likely author for me is Muhammad Shah Jami, who composed a version of Lazat Nisa in the early 17th century and dedicated it to his patron, the Sultan of Golconda, Abdullah Qutb Shah. Um, in the text, he clarifies, Jami clarifies that even though his name is Muhammad Shah, he uses the takhallus or the pen name Jami when composing poetry. While not a lot is known about Jami's background, he must be part of the higher social strata because he mentions that his father was a military man of some repute. He was a sipadar. My examples today are from his version of Lazat Nisa, copied in 1797 and housed at the British Library. Uh, many Lazat Nisa manuscripts um, also attribute authorship to Ziauddin Naqshabi. Um, Suzanne Kurz has argued that this Naqshabi could very well be the famous Sufi writer, uh, most known for composing Tuti Nama, Tales of the Parrot, which obviously a Persian translation of the Sanskrit Shuka Saptati. There's also a corpus of anonymous Lazat um, whose numbers grow rapidly towards the end of 18th century. The usual stematic method um, cannot be used to establish the archetype for one particular Lazat because it's difficult to ascertain if the earliest extant text could be the ancestors of all these other copies. Hence, by the end of 18th century, there were too many variations in manuscripts in both uh, in terms of both content and form to allow a linear trace. Um, having outlined the translocal and sort of multi-directional history of these Indic and Persian medical and erotological texts, I will also briefly examine the extent of social percolation of such information about diseases and cures. Um, to do so, I will look at a more eclectic group of sources that include uh, the 17th century Manual of Manners, Mirza Nama, um, also called the Book of Gentlemen, um, in order to understand the usage-based meaning of the enormous range of technical terms that I keep using in this paper, I'll use them in conjunction with early modern medical dictionaries, um, such as Nurul Din Shirazi's uh, Al-Fazal Adviya that we discussed um, earlier, and also more general 18th century dis uh, dictionaries um, of idiomatic phrases, such as the Miratul Istala, written by Mughal courtier Anandra Mukhlis. Um, further, the concern about unbridled lust was also exhibited in the popular and satirical writings of 18th century poets like Mir Jafar Zatelli, who will also make you know, uh, his cameo in the paper. Um, my methodology then looks across these diverse texts to comment upon intertextuality, as well as early modern writing practices about sexual diseases, um, such as referring to well-established ilmul ba or sexual science traditions and prescriptions in order to establish um, the respectability of cures that are being offered by these hakims. Um, now, the erotological and medical texts might have included a range of information, yet there is a limit to the archive, what gets written or even joked about or what, and what is not. I've chosen to combine sources from a wide temporal period and map them on to a narrower, more liminal geography. Um, therefore, it's only after combining these erotomedical sources, a mainstay of this paper with a range of other legal literary sources that I could create a tentative picture of how deeply concerns about impotency were embedded in a range of texts and mindsets in early modern South Asia, a subject not necessarily touched upon by existing secondary work. Today, my work is in conversation with works of scholars like Rosalind O'Hanlon, Indrani Chatterjee, Kathleen Schofield, Ali Anushaher, and Emma Flatt, who have their own individual conceptualizations on transformations in masculinity and how the Mirza or the Mughal gentleman had to avoid sexual passivity for some you know, of feminine modes of being, um, to maintain the social order and to avoid changes or charges of political impotency. A lot of these nominative discussions were about political sovereignty, uh, how the emperor extended his control and enforced discipline on the bodies of men at court who must make public displays of power and control over knowledge, material things, commodities, women, people of lower status, um, and over themselves to justify their masculinity. Now, such discipline is often physical as well as cultural, 
but my work today brings a completely different set of sources trying to center stage the body through the lens of sex and medicine here gender and sexuality do not propel courtly or political issues but but these are the main issues i do derive from and acknowledge the usefulness of research that asks questions about masculinity gendered relationships health and the state but my paper and larger project has tried to sort of invert the lens a little bit more and follow the archive of sex and sexual health unapologetically sex and medicine are center stage today diving straight into my primary medical texts then in the tibbe akbari as i said written by mohammad akbar razani from here on just razani the first step was to create a healthy body which could receive and provide pleasure in arzani's understanding of the humoral model malnourished bodies could not produce good seed which became the primary cause of sexual dysfunction consequently all his prescriptions first used food to restore the faulty humors and facilitate increase in desire to copulate and produce strong seed he relied on a range of stimulants that were used in combination with other ingredients using very precise quantities and that needed to be ingested in a prescribed manner to have the desired effect on humoral conditions of an individual these stimulants were not only featured heavily in the tibbi or the medical books but could also be found in erotological books cookbooks and books for household management like the bayazi khushboo in the chapter 19 of tibbi akbari which is where the, this excerpt is from um the uh, ap, the chapters aptly titled that amraz e bemardane maksoos um ast be that amraz e bemardane maksoos ast um the first type of sexual disease is described in particular detail um arzani writes that if the body is lean and weak from a lack of food um due to which the spirit ru the wind ri and blood khoon which ensures continued augmentation of desire in the body declines the signs of emaciation of the said body are weakness during sex body color becomes yellow and there's a decline in their desire for food the ilaj or the cure here for strengthening the body is to eat good food sleep a lot abstain from sex and be engaged in jesting um, and pleasure and fragrances and to consume a diet that is suitable for your own condition and consume the majun labub for a complete cure this passage demonstrates the key difference between two types of lack of desires and the ways to combat them that lies within the tibbi akbari in the preface of this chapter on special diseases of men azani clarifies the problem during sex as as two problems there are two of two types one that the desire during sex is enfeebled which leads to impotence and the other is that the penis becomes indolent the entire chapter prognosis of disease symptoms treatment everything is defined by what issue the problem is stemming from lack of desire or penile problems a simple glance at the focus put on understanding the reasons behind impotency and finding appropriate cures for it shows how large a threat it must have been to early modern south asian concepts of manliness now it seems that impotence was envisioned as a disease that could be cured in a variety of ways medical and psychological most cures contain medicaments with varying numbers of ingredients and degrees of complexity and i will not go into them today um consider the typology followed by a particular ilaj or cure for impotency from the tibbe akbari um here arzani specifically writes about cures for men whose sexual desires have abandoned them whose copulation finishes early and for whom it has been a long time since the successful production of seminal fluid this physical malfunction was not caused by inhibitions or psychological neurosis or psychosomatic malfunctions um or disorders and yet the cure addressed both um remedies to stimulate the mind um and simple or compound medicaments to stimulate the seminal fluid in the above mentioned incident um the reason for the problem lies in the bones where the production of bone marrow has reduced drastically in unani medical theories the production the non production of bone marrow is linked with the impurity of blood pure blood is supposed to be the source of nourishment for all cardigan cardinal organs and semen is secreted from it in this case copulation has usually stopped 
but in case there is sexual activity that no pleasure is derived from it and to restore pleasure to this patient arzani advises listening to music from the tambur uh now the choice of instrument is not without its own importance everything here has a purpose as katherine schofield has argued in her doctoral thesis all major hindustani instruments have their unique temperament affective powers and the time that they should be played the tambur with its warm and moist temperaments was effective against cold and dry earthly elements in other words it could cure melancholy and was applicable which was applicable here um azani advises them to read also advises them to read books about, that talk about sex and the beloved even though they remain unnamed azani is most likely indicating erotological books like the kokshastra and lazatunisa which talk about sex and would be helpful in reigniting the urge in a man's mind and consequently in his body indicating a very unique trend in the intellectual history of indo-islamic early modernity azani was building and the scholarly relationship with books on sex and their intertextuality now as shown by scholars like san agustin and mayan many medieval um, arabic physicians recommended that their patients read pornographic works on the multiple positions and forms of intercourse or even listen to erot- erotic anecdotes closer to home and my own time period Nuruddin Shirazi the author of the Persian medical encyclopedia Ilajate Dara Shikohi also mentioned earlier um who on whom um Fabrizio Speziale has written extensively combined indic knowledge with a greco islamic one in the section on lack of sexual desire and weak potency he describes medicines um but also advised men to watch copulating animals and to listen to stories about sexual intercourse i argue that these authors of tibbia texts were not only aware of the laza tradition but they were also shaping each other's perception of on the subject all of these authors especially arzani keeps getting referred to in later texts and i can uh, of course talk more about that as well um by what you're suggesting books on pleasure as part of the remedy for sexual diseases arzani then becomes part of what i call uh, the network of mutual endorsement of authorship this process moves beyond a mere borrowing of recipes and ingredients and becomes a dialogical interaction which not only shapes authorial authority and intertextuality in the field of sexual sciences but also influences both formal and informal public and professional and private attitudes towards knowledge production about sex in this period in such a multilingual translational scenario authorial agency changes as well once a text or its commentary is created by the author it becomes part of this large network of correspondence which can be traced in the archives um formal amongst fellow practitioners of sexual and medical sciences and probably and infinitely harder to trace informal practitioners inside the harem like dayas kabilas um and amongst commercial castes associated with the business such as barbers apothecary owners etc so how are these medical texts verbalizing these issues um uh, in most early modern medical treatises impotency is enmeshed with issues of infertility and sometimes the terms are used even interchangeably but these two issues are not the same impotence is best understood as the ability to engage in sexual activity and infertility is understood as the inability to in- to conceive a child um even linguistically in tibbi akbari when the discussion is centered around impotence the terminology used revolves around increasing sexual power and vigor and uh, and is categorized under kuvvate ba on the other hand when discussing infertility more often than not the terminology used involves um or revolves around inzal or seminal ejaculation so let's look at very briefly uh, a component of one of the most popular solutions to in both these um, in both these kind of recipes the majoon labub that we were talking about uh, which is an electuary there is no standardized version of this prescription but certain ingredients were persistently included in various texts to make this electuary items such as dry ginger cinnamon filbert nut black pepper musk were combined with honey and were for the most part warming and stimulating according to contemporaneous med- materia medica such as alfazul adwiye or talif sharif most of these were also part of the section titled aphrodisiac 
even individually all these were supposed to invoke heat in the body which would counteract the cold the primary cause of sexual dysfunction in most the, most of these texts all of these elements were supposed to improve the heat of the body and as the male seed needed heat to be potent and fluid to fulfill its generative potential these were all important but in most cases reproduction was never overtly mentioned although it would be implied considering the end goal of all of these recipes was to make the seminal fluid stronger and to ensure that a uh, conception is provoked should this prove insufficient obviously there were other external remedies that i can again talk about later lastly a detailed study of the cures indicates that they offer two types of solution a psychological and a material treatment for curing the disease an argument can be made that sexual diseases especially impotence were understood on two levels one of the mind and other of the actual disease parts part and while the symptoms would only manifest as an actual physical disease it was imperative to also give a solution for what ailed the mind as a sex was as much about pleasuring and exciting the mind as it was about the physical release associated with a climax now turning to my other source base lazotonissa i'll refrain into going uh, from going into details of its prescriptions to cure impotency um, which was caused by cold except to say that it involved creating a very thick paste made of earthworms of course i hope after cleaning them properly these will then have to be finely ground and mixed with uh, flour and raisin gum um and eventually it will increase sexual desire what i want to focus today is what happens when impotence is cured as lazat records the effects that the medicaments would have on the patient in such a scenario it is un- in this lazat is unique as it bridges the gap between curatives and the experience even if theoretically the curatives work in the 30th chapter of lazat nisa entitled darbayani kuvate bahgui um he discusses medicines to increase uh, sexual power he writes that this medicine will augment the semen in the body and there will not be any cold thereafter it increases hunger in the belly and wipes out bad blood of any kind semen is augmented by removing the sardi or the cold here the cold is not always literal but indicates a quality causing inactiveness of the semen which seems to have stopped um its movement or or become frozen now we've discussed combating cold in tibbe akbari but it is through envisioning what effects of consuming these medicaments would have on an individual that we can understand the interplay between medical theories and social conceptions of virility the tenor of the effects is mostly physiological for instance the removal of bad blood from the body would result in a return of health and vigor which would be shown in the redness of the cheeks in direct opposition if you remember of the yellowed skin which was a sign of sexual dysfunction mentioned earlier in tibbe akbari these physical effects combined with a sexual drive would in turn increase the social value of the individual for instance the fourth benefit of cures of kuvate pa was to assist in maintaining youth in the man so as to remain attractive the red cheeks and a lithe body are supposed to enhance this attractiveness unlike the tibbia text lazat sees kuvate pa in both medical and humoral terms as well as a mean to means to ensure pleasure in the sexual act this is evinced by the fact that while it gives many kuvate ba prescriptions in the chapter it also expands greatly on the effects of the medicament for jami the end is as important as the means to achieve it in this lazat becomes the meeting point for medical manuals and a host of theoretical formulations about pleasure in medicine now if we move beyond these texts we realize that there is clearly a congruity between medical texts travelogues and literature when we compare the various recipes meant for the exact same purpose to increase sexual vigor kuvateba but where are these recipes being sold to all these supposedly important men now i would like you to consider the 18th century description of the site of a bustling market chok sadullah khan in front of the gate of red fort um in murakkai delhi or portrait of delhi uh, by dargah khuli khan He, he he writes and i quote the demand of every person whatever they ask for they can get here special mention should be made of applying the remedy for onanism and uh, to return firmness strength to the membrum virile and medicines taken to prolong ejaculation and wonderful cure for venereal diseases 
um it is a strange time that individuals and wicked men are staking their clothes even staking their lives to buy an ointment and oil and he's talking about you know uh, aphrodisiacs um by so by sheer force of his pleasing speech the ustad can extort money from these people um now in the eyes of dargah kuli khan wares displayed in this bazaar were also i think part of a realm of wish fulfillment one could seek remedies for sexual diseases ranging from obviously atishak which is uh, supposedly syphilis to gonorrhea he acknowledged the inefficacy of these cures as well but the sheer range of them is significant he mentions finding remedies for coitus interruptus venereal diseases and for prolonging ejaculation furthermore for him the immediacy of the crisis of masculinity caused by sexual dysfunction and disease was such that the customers were eager to purchase any spurious cure taking advantage of this desperation then the bazaar uh, physician swindled them this description then also needs to be seen in conjunction with another contemporary poet mir jafar zatalli a controversial figure zatalli wrote satirical poetic commentaries on his time consider the following excerpt मेंढक की झाट नटनी का नाच शुफ्तालू का पात स्कंद की जड़ भोसड़ी की चाल बेअल के सीने का तुख दुनिया की ठगी आई एम नॉट रीडिंग द होल थिंग बट जस्ट द जेनेटल्स ऑफ अ फ्रॉग अ फीमेल रोप डांस डांस द लीफ ऑफ अ नेक्टरीन कैमल शिवर यू नो एंड द ऑयल फ्रॉम अ इडियट ऑफ ब्रेनलेस पर्सन चेस्ट एंड द वर्ल्ड ट्रिकरी and as much as i've enjoyed reading obscenities in front of such an august audience that these are just excerpts from a longer prescription titled nuskhae churane imsak ve hazma taam prescriptions for digestive powers um and increasing pleasure or retention of seminal fluid firstly it is important to reiterate that zatali might not have been trained in the medical trade but he possessed the knowledge to draw a connection between hazma digestion with prescriptions for sexual prowess secondly one of his techniques as a satirical poet was to frequently distort standardized patterns of literary works such as akbarat which are daily court reports or arzidasht court petitions the fact that he follows this technique to satirize nuskhe or prescriptions frequently found in simpler late 18th medical texts such as khirka nuskajat risalai ba shows that these nuskhas or and their literary compositions must have been common knowledge as for this poem the formula like mixing of providing nuske by the lower levels of hakims um especially on sexual matters must have been popularly consumed because zatali deliberately uses their form to satirize not only the prescription for such diseases but the practice of falsity in bazaar sexual medical trade the prescription is like any other nuska medical nuska but peppered with explicatives and galis um the ingredients are a mix of everyday items and the fantastical but all of them make three major points for me firstly that there was a well established connection between food digestion and ejaculation one does not need to read the entire poem as to look at the title would make it evident to the reader or most probably i believe the listener the second connection is a play bit play um is between the play on words by zatali so much so that a nuska composed entirely of an odd assortment of ingredients becomes a satire on the anxieties of men who wanted to keep their seminal or sexual desire seminal fluid or sexual desire strong which in turn would keep their masculinity strong or at least keep up the illusion that they were strong uh, thirdly and most importantly it is also a satire on how some of these prescriptions for increasing or restoring sexual desires were known to include obscure items beyond the resources of an ordinary person some of these items were available readily such as for instance the root of garlic or iskandaras that he also mentions garlic has long been considered an aphrodisiac both in unani and ayurvedic tradition the latter considers it to be very sharply hot and has a pungent savor um it is penetrating um cordial and it helps one's hair grow it's a powerful aphrodisiac it increases strength um it's a rejuvenant um zatali uses the implicit qualities of this ingredient to situate his prescription even one composed in absolute jest in the complex humoral system of early modern south asia 
On the other hand, some ingredients were more difficult to procure, such as the sand lizard's fat or Egyptian skink that Murakai Dili had mentioned was available in these bazaars. A variety of lizard, this Egyptian skink was a variety of lizard which when dried and salted was credited in the traditional pharmacopoeias with remarkable aphrodisiac qualities. Apart from using animal analogies, Satali brings in obscene Hindi and Urdu curse words um, to indicate not only that this was intended to be taken in a jocular manner, but that delaying male ejaculation and coitus or retentivity, however you'd like to sort of call it, were everyday masculine concerns, so much so that steps taken by people to procure these cures opened them up to ridicule. Now, this ridicule seems to be all pervasive. In the Miratul Istala, when substantiating the mean, meaning of Jumbidan, the word Jumbidan as uh, the gathering of a number of people together or an assembly, the author Anandra Mukhlis added an anecdote. Here, Mustafa Kuli Khan, who had grown old in the exercise of composing sportful and funny poetry, one day narrated this incident that I have made, him, not me, uh, had made a slave girl of mine, my bedmate, and intended to derive sexual pleasures from her. But in this respect, as a result of old age and a hundred physical defects, nothing happened. The shame which had overcome before the movement could occur made me watery from top to toe. Kazi Abdul Wahab Big, who was present in the circle of assembly, addressed Mustafa Kuli Khan and remarked, um, Sahib, you should have told some other person so that he could have accomplished this on your behalf. Now, this anecdote, of course, has larger implications on ageism and a loss of youth, again, something that I would love to talk about in the Q&A. But for me, it also highlights an issue brought um, up in medical texts frequently, impotency as a cause and symptom of old age, which included digestive problems, losing appetite for other pleasurable pursuits, and which could also be indicative of who was the intended audience or one of the final consumers even for all of these Kuvvate Ba recipes. Lastly, here the condemnation was less of the older, older man's sexual activity as much as it's a comment on the loss of masculinity by not being able to do so and by having to ask someone else um, to do it on their behalf. So how does all of this information come into play in the context of early modern nobility? To do so, these solutions also need to be seen in context of the advice encapsulated in texts like Mirza Nama, which suggests that to achieve pleasure, the Mirza, the Mughal Mirza, must eat better, eat according to his tabiat or temperament, sleep well, engage in pleasurable activities, surround himself with good smells and music. The larger point that I would, that I hope that everybody takes away from this is that there seems to be a universal language of maintaining and promoting male well-being. It also shows intertextuality, borrowing between texts like medical texts, mirror for princes, and narrative medical manuals. Pleasure is, then, a very legitimate cure, prescribed in the theoretical realm by scholars like Arzani, illustrated and expounded in the tangible realm by authors like Muhammad Jami, in texts like Lazut Nisa, and made real through the satirization of Zatali and Mukhlis. As I've already argued, this pleasure does not only have to be sexual, but satisfy each aspect, sense, smell, sound, taste. This in turn could be linked to contemporary perceptions of fertility and the desire for successful reproduction to ensure a strong empire whose hereditary system of passing wealth and property would be ensured with the ability of a male populace's ability to successfully produce healthy offspring. Most of these noblemen, aspirational or not, needed to produce offsprings to at least nominally secure their property and maintain marital relations. So to conclude a talk where you were lured sort of by sex and then bored by medicine, I will end today's paper with one of the most extreme examples of what would happen if the flow of semen was interrupted. It would drive the man insane. In the first chapter of the Akbari on the diseases of head and brain, Arzani writes about malikholia and maraki, a form of insanity having a direct effect on an individual's sexual life, which was said to be caused by humoral imbalances particularly connected to the stomach. The humors are collected and the heat of the body passes them from limbs to the brain. Apart from indigestion, again, and pain in the stomach, the patient complains that his genitals are hot, there's frequent priapism, and the desire for uh, sexual intercourse might be great, but there was an incapacity in proper performance. 
This was not an exceptional proclamation. And in another section of the same chapter, Azani acknowledged that the loss of spermatic fluid could not only affect a man's sexual life, but could lead to, quote, a disorder in judgment resulting in the loss of power of thought. In such a situation where the mental is deeply entwined with the sexual, curative remedies of the mind and the body become imperative. This is especially true for any Mughal Mirza or nobleman for whom losing power of thought would be detrimental to his optimal performance of duties, theoretically towards his sovereign superiors, as well as his family. Thank you. Sonia, thanks so much. This was so good. Uh, this was, I, I really thank you for walking us through this complex uh, space of the medical, the courtly, the legalistic and the poetic world. But that I think that sort of a detailed walk is the basis of good sociocultural history, uh, right? Um, I really uh, do commend the diversity of texts through which you've approached these questions. Um, I, I think it's never an easy task to glide between genres and integ integrate primary texts, both oral and written, into a tight argument. Uh, so thank you so much for doing this for us. Um, I, we will be opening for Q&A shortly, uh, and I would ask everybody to put their um, uh, questions uh, in the Q&A box. But before we do that, I, Anurag and I, I think, have a few questions to ask you ourselves. We'd like to use this space for a little bit of a discussion. I want to ask you a simple question. Um, since these are, you, you do talk a little bit about that, uh, in fact, um, but I do want to ask you that since these are differently produced texts, uh, are their consumers different too? In the sense, is the if the intended audience varies for each type of text, then what does one say about the circulation of this knowledge? I know you talked about the bazaars and uh, medical men in the bazaars, uh, but I'm thinking also about, say, a high treatise produced in a court and a medical prescription either written down hurriedly or told in a city square. And then similar knowledge then going back to the local court for individual cases of um, say um, inheritance or impotence and so on. So um, we've, we've had a lot, uh, we've gone through many, many kinds of questions, of texts and questions, but I want to think about how did this knowledge network work, especially maybe before the 18th century? Would you be able to talk a little about that? And thank you again for such a good talk. Thank you. That that's that's actually um, a great question. But I mean, do you also have 40 minutes uh, for this? But um, um, I think my answer would sort of connect um, to larger questions of early modern reading public and transfer of medical knowledge amongst them. Um, and as much as I say that, like it's, it's, a, it's hard to, to pin down that, you know, uh, immediately. Uh, but what I would say is that um, most of these authors who I've talked about today were composing sort of theoretical medical manuals, uh, for example, Ilajate Dara Shikohi or um, and were writing sort of ancillary medical texts as well. They were not only producing this one text. So while there's a Tibbe Akbari for Arzani, there's also a Mizanul Tib, which is, uh, say, an abridgment of medical knowledge and a Karabuddin, a Kadri that he wrote, which is a pharmacopoeia. So that kind of ensured that, that this person has left other things where one can go for sort of knowledge, uh, for more knowledge or for a backup or those kind of, those kind of things. Now, these texts then are being, I think, are being circulated amongst this class of uh, medical theoreticians and physicians, uh, mm -hmm. most of whom I think belong to um, Hakim families, um, they have a group of related medical texts to their names. Um, some are related to the imperial court, um, to, to uh, some other uh, sort of high nobleman as patron. Um, 
are attached to a household for example matlab alavi khan uh, he we have case files um, that he's sort of left uh, where you know you can go and see that individual patients would come to him as well as some other sort of high ranking nobles would would as well and there is a hierarchy um within the text of who um is is sort of his intended audience um and i think this sort of network was also uh, sort of supplemented i wouldn't call call it supplemented but also existing parallelly there was a lower register lower level register which was which was uh, sort of uh, subsisting with them which would include the nai which was the barber surgeon the kabila the dai um these are people traditionally attributed with surgical and medical experience but their role also keeps shifting so it's difficult to say what their educational uh, qualification was but i believe that um a case can be made that these texts were being read um by them um also even within the texts for example uh, arzani finds his way into other texts which are written uh, and his knowledge sort of finds this knowledge finds its way to other texts which are composed in this period for example um a 1760s uh text called kulasatul mujarrabat uh, which is a uh, sort of medical experiences um it's an anonymous work um and it in the section on kuvate ba the author clarifies that the portion of the recipes were taken from tibbi akbari of miar zani so he's clearly saying that these texts are in conversation with each other um so i don't know how how clearly i answer that but but the point is that individual cases and individual texts find their way into uh, this network as well thank you i i got a lot out of this this now this terrain and this structure of knowledge networks is much clearer now especially for a pre 18th century world i think it's a great thing yeah. thanks so much anurag do you Wonderful. Yeah, uh, this was such a riveting talk, Sonia, and I really enjoyed it. And I think I agree with you that Arzani is somebody who's you know whose works are widely circulating through the 18th century, and in that in that sense, I think your work contributes significantly to the emerging field of the history of medicine, right? In in early modern South Asia and in South Asian history generally. So, in terms of history of medicine, then. Uh, so we know that Fabrizio Spizziale, Deborah Schlein, Sima Alavi, and others have shown. that there was an intermixing of greco arabic or unani medicine or tib and ayurvedic medicine right yeah, through yeah, the, through the yeah. medieval and early modern periods yeah. right through those 16 17 18 centuries um so do you see sanskrit or braj vocabulary entering and ayurvedic concepts entering yeah. your your persian and urdu medical texts in their descriptions of sexual diseases virility restoring desire pleasure infertility etc um yes uh, thank you for that question and again that's something that i've sort of tried to do in my thesis um but to answer that question i think i i do that better with just one example um so in one of my uh, persian texts um from late 18th century um a khirka um there's a prescription which was supposed to restore i mean the title was um nuskai kuvate ba so it was supposed to restore um sexual vigor um and then the person uh, considering it's anonymous the author goes into um what the nuska is which i will not explain here but then the person adds a line where i mean i'm sort of roughly quoting what they're saying they say that the desired outcome of using this prescription would be to restore the sat which basically in sanskrit essentially means jeevni shakti or takat which is what i get in my ayurvedic texts um which is the vitality of life or strength um, you know which happens in texts like koka prasanga vyadi chikitsa or koka shastra which are koka manjari which are the ayurvedic texts sexual medical texts that i look at so this concept of vitality then um which i mean even though the humorally there are three humors in ayurveda and four humors in 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 um unani and that could clash the there are similarities the authors managed to bring similarities within the text without necessarily going into how it's different so here he just said that this sat is 
is very similar to say the Persian ru, the concept of ru, ru. Mm. Um, so you know, there's a sort of Indo-Persian Arabic medical lexicon that sometimes emerges in these texts as well. Yeah, that's that's incredible. Yeah, it's it's so interesting to see the overlap of of the Ayurvedic and the Yunnani traditions, and how um, I think Pizzali has an article right where he talks about how the, the the three humor system from Ayurveda is being mapped onto the four Yunnani akhlaq or the humors. This is really it's not without its yeah. It's I'm so sorry. It's not without its contradictions. I'm not saying that it's very easily sort of mapping on. There are lots of examples where. Um, you know, they'll say, well, this worked. So, you know, the author will say gallon and then say, um, well, this worked, but the temperament of Indo Hindustan is different. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, they'll just add like, but those are very difficult, very rare. And, you know, it takes painstakingly, you have to find those examples where they actually verbalize, not verbalize, but whatever, they write it down. Right. And I think especially in pharmacopoeia, right, they are often using yeah. Ayurvedic terms and Ayurvedic medicines and, and the words Absolutely. are written in Parsi. So it's, yeah, it's yeah. really interesting. Awesome. Uh, thank you. Sonia, we actually, thank you so much for answering our questions. We do have a few questions lined up for you now in the uh, Q&A box. Uh, this is uh, from um, Indrani Chatterjee, who loved your talk and the presentation. And um, they're asking if uh, if they can ask you to refine whose ple pleasure only the male Mirza, or as your discussion of deferral of ejaculation suggests, also the female companion of the Mirza. There are a couple of others, and I'll get to those if you want to take this first and then... Yeah. Um, yeah. Actually, uh, uh, maybe I can we can club these questions because the other oh. two are mm -hmm. also ask. Um, one person is asking compliments you and says it's a fantastic talk, and says is there much on women and their health in the manuscripts? And again, are there prescription? And this is from Tilotama Mukherjee. Are there prescriptions for women as well, or do the texts focus exclusively on men? So I. Yes, you can take all three questions together and address sure. Thank you. Sure. Um, thank you so much. Thank you uh, for those questions. Um, I think I would be able to... Okay, so just to put that out first, there's a lot in the text about women. There's a separate chapter in Tibbe Akbari. So chapter 19 is... Uh, sexual diseases of men, uh, chapter 21 is sexual uh, is uh, special diseases of women. So there's an entire sort of world that there exists for, um, for sort of um, issues related to women and their health in the manuscripts. Um, having said that, uh, in terms of what Professor Chatterjee was asking, um, in the, the example that I was using today, um, whose pleasure is actually a complicated question and I'm glad that she asked it. It's both. At the moment, it is the pleasure of the man, but this text is situated in the two seed model of conception. So for those who might not know it, there are uh, at, at this point of time, two models um, exist. One is the sort of Aristotelian one seed model that sort of argues that um, only men emit emit semen um, or seminal fluid while women sort of contribute with brute matter, which is like a substance that's less pure and, and, and sort of less sanctified than the semen and hence less um, involved in the process of conception, um, which made them sort of secondary to the generative, overall generative process. While, and this dominated uh, discussions of, of conception for a very long time. But Tibbe Akbari, by the 18th century, Tibbe Akbari and, and all the other texts that I'm talking about um, have firmly sort of moved on to the two seed model, which, which um, was popularized um, by many translations, which I'm not going into, but which argued that men and women both emit semen during intercourse or seminal fluid during intercourse. And these must mingle together to sort of produce a fetus. Um, and for men, the, like I was talking about in my talk, um, pleasure was necessary to emit. Um, 
as similarly for women they had to achieve pleasure in the act for the um, for the semen to uh, ejaculate for her as well which would finally lead to the nuxe so it's both and uh, there is a discussion in lazutunisa a proper three chapter discussion where um, jami is talking about first um, what's the process of having sex with a virgin woman and towards the end he mentions that if not done properly she would not achieve pleasure and there would be no conception um, and you know so the fact is that and then obviously the second chapter and the third chapter goes into if it doesn't happen then what to do so there is a clear understanding of women pleasure and health which is happening simultaneously in these texts and and there are several curative practices for it having said that the last thing i would say on the subject where i've gone way too long with this answer the last thing that i would say on this subject is that the tenor of those chapters though is always about reproduction in the sense that while for men we talked about uh, inzal and we talked about uh, kuvvat e ba for women it's always about hamle it's always about what stops the conception and then what to do to uh, to sort of uh, elevate it or cure it so one has to be mindful of that thank you uh, thanks sonia so we have another question from shujaat mirza who's asking um some of these texts would be even referenced today and it seems that perhaps from catering to a niche core of elites they entered a larger populace but we see a loss of the holistic approach of music and other pursuits in the present day as traditional med- medicine is pursued today so the research sort of brings some of this out but if you can comment more on it thanks and also indrani chatterjee has commented to your answer and has said this is a fantastic clarification and looking forward to the book thank you so much thank you um um i'm so sorry i can't see i can't seem to see the q and a um so i if you could just repeat that question one more time sure, sure. it's a question uh, that says uh, some of these texts would even be referenced today right yeah, and it yeah, seems yes. that perhaps some of some uh, perhaps from catering to a niche core of elites they entered a larger populace but we see a loss of the holistic approach of music and other pursuits in the present day as traditional men- medicine is pursued yeah. so the research brings some of this out but you could comment more on it thank you so much thank you for that question and i think um he's absolutely right that some of these texts are referenced uh, today and they have a long history in the 19th century and 20th century and later um and there are people who worked on it uh, there are people who working on it um anuj kaushal uh, charu gupta there are other people who worked on it i uh, myself hope to work on this for a post doctoral project or as a uh, project in my future i would like to look at sort of what happens before 1850 with these texts and there are so many of them um but um and of course that and i i also believe that from catering to a niche audience or can we call them niche audience i hope this this talk showed that it was not necessarily a niche audience even in this period um this sort of you know um, it entered the larger domain after the coming of lithographs and printing um in in south asia um having said that obviously there is a loss i don't i don't believe if there's a loss of um holistic approach in terms of music helping um i, I think um if i mean i can't necessarily um, sort of comment on research that's been done on it today um but i do believe that uh, other uh, holistic medical approaches using a sense of uh, sort of visual um, you know sort of encouraging um, uh, music encouraging visual uh, stimulation for uh, curing sexual dysfunction is happening at the same time so um, yeah that that that's all i can comment on sorry thank you thank you sonia thank you for participants for asking these questions so if um, i will uh, just add another question um there are actually two more questions in the chat yeah actually um yeah i'm just 
I'll I'll relay one and then Anurag, we can pick up another one. Okay, so this is uh, from Professor Munis Faruqi, who uh, thank you for this wonderful talk and asks, how does the expectation of eating well, there are three questions here. Uh, expectation of eating well, showing signs of virility or vitality, etc., play out against the expectations of ascetic frugality, eating little, controlling passion in Mughal imperial culture. Uh, second, do any of your 18th century authors make a connection between imperial collapse and the increasingly passive or impotent men? Uh, so, And uh, then if there is rising medical knowledge and theorizing across the 16th and 17th centuries, uh, where is the new knowledge or theorizing coming from? What is driving it? Rising literacy and growing reading publics? wealth or political concerns i am also if you could just put that in the yeah, in the chat box then i'll be able to sort of answer each and yeah. every one of those um questions uh thank you dr Faruqi, for all of those three questions um so i'll take them one by one um i think um i so I'll go with the last one first. Um, if there's a rising medical knowledge and theorizing across 16th and 17th century, where's the new knowledge or theorizing coming from? I think the answer to that um, actually lies in something that I've uh, sort of in my dissertation called uh, Ilmul Koch, um, the, the development of a genre of Ilmul Koch, which to me seems to be a combination of Ilmul Bah, a, a, a pre-existing, very, very deeply rooted um, uh, tradition of sexual sciences, what Patrick Frank calls sexual sciences, as well as Ilm of Ilmul Koch or the knowledge of Koch that is being written about um, in Sanskrit, Braj and Persian um, in 16th and 17th century. And I think um, what's happening is that in texts like Lazutun Nisa, Asrarul Nisa, um, and all of these smaller texts that are being created in the 16th, 17th, and increasingly in the 18th century, these knowledges or these knowledge traditions are coming together. And authors who are working on this are also adding their own commentaries into it. So that I think is, is how these traditions um, are coming together and how new knowledge or knowledge that has been translated from various sources is coming together in a pool in a text because if you look at Lazatunisa texts in this period 17th century onwards and 18th century and deeply in the 18th century there is no one version of Lazatunisa there's there are so many versions um, and which is why in that chart I said there was Diyadi Nakshabi there was Jami and there were anonymous authors and what you can see across is that each um text each version of the text is bringing in new material that of course i only had four years so i couldn't trace back all of them but if you trace them back some of them you can talk about you find from um, you know um, uh, translations of galen some you find from uh, uh, commentaries which are written on uh, madhun shifa so it's all of these uh, texts are becoming sources for this genre of Ilmul Koch that comes together in the 17th and 18th century. The theorization is coming from these authors reading texts, not necessarily always telling you where they're reading it from, but of course there are 18th century copies that do tell you where it is coming from, that, that it even nominally tells you who the author is. It doesn't necessarily have to be that author, but at least he's telling you where he's borrowing his source from or where this knowledge is coming from. Um, and I think obviously rising literacy and a growing reading public and money in the hand of um, pr medical practitioners themselves um, is leading to a lot of these texts being written for medical practitioners. So some of my 18th century copies actually say that this was made for, the scribe actually says this was made for Hakim. Falana. So there's there's always um, the possibility that Hakims themselves uh, in later 18th century had money. Um, and why I say this is because these copies actually are not going into the erotological part of it at all. They're concentrating on the medical bit. Those become larger, those sections become larger than their copies. Um, so, so I think there are multiple level of things happening here. And Obviously, rising literacy and growing reading public is important, but 
consumption um, and and sort of um, money and who has money to buy these items is also important, equally important. Um, and then coming to um, sort of do any of your 18th century authors make a connection between imperial collapse and passive important men. Um, I think I do sort of comment upon it in the talk that of course one could read it as um, the sort of imperial collapse and passive and important men and Zatali does that in a lot of his his satirical writings but I but I do believe that to make to use that model and to put it on what is happening in this text is actually doing a disservice to the text that I have looked at. Um, they're not talking about imperial collapse. There's, th there are so many copies, uh, smaller copies, not only of Tibbe Akbari, but only of sections of Kuvvate Ba from Tibbe Akbari reproduced in multiple bayazes, khirkas, nuskhajats. So it's not necessarily talking about this. This is not a concern as it were in the kind of sources that I looked at. Um, but obviously, uh, it's something that I have deeply thought about and, 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 and sort of addressed. Uh, to the first question, um, how does expectations of eating well, showing signs of virility, play out um, against expectations of frugality, eating little, controlling passion? Um, I think one of the clues, while this dichotomy works really well for certain um, authors like David Gordon White, or they've done brilliant work on this. Um, I think in my sources, what I realized was um, that it's actually a very false kind of dichotomy. Um, so for example, if you were to go back to the example that I had given, it says, don't abstain from sex, but indulge in food, indulge in uh, jesting, indulge in listening to good music. So it's not always lack of pleasure. It can be lack of pleasure of a certain kind to cure pleasure of a different uh, to cure impotency of a different kind altogether. So I do believe that, that which is why I say pleasure is a very, very amazing category to be used here, only because it's not, there is no one kind of pleasure. Multiple kinds of pleasures can be used in a cure and they can sort of, you know, be together or they can be in complete opposition of each other as well sometimes. So I do believe that, that, you know, more work is needed there, but I, I, I do believe that that dichotomy that didn't really work well with, with the kind of sources that I was looking at. Sorry, I hope that answers everything. Yeah, that was, um, yeah, uh, um, Dr. Farooq just responded and he said, great responses, thank you. <laughs> so, okay, great. We have another question from uh, Shauna Ghosh, uh, who says, thank you for the fascinating talk. I particularly enjoyed the range of beautifully illustrated manuscripts that you showed us. I wanted to ask you about the production of these manuscripts and whether these were used for transmission and dissemination of knowledge systems, tying back to Aprajita's question on circulation and consumption. Could you also tell us about the methodologies and conceptual tools that you use to read the textual and visual record in tandem? Thank you, thank you. That's, that's again, a really interesting and uh, important question. Um, so um, in terms of my Tibia sources, there weren't any that were heavily illustrated. There were some stray illustrations somewhere and especially not in the sections that I was looking at. Um, of course, there are illustrations in later medical manuscripts, where, especially where they're talking about tillism and they're talking about uh, sort of those kind of things, but not the illustrations or paintings that we generally associate with erotological texts of people copulating. Um, now, um, within the, the sort of 60 or 70 odd manuscripts that I looked at for Lazat um, I think I would say about 12 to 15 were illustrated, out of which um, 12 were illustrations of sexual nature. There were some outlier copies where um, the text is Lazat Nisa, but obviously the visual material is, is uh, I don't think it's necessarily connected where, um, where they're talking about, I mean, there's um, 
uh, Dasha Avtar happening on one side and there are all sorts of other things. There is one copy that I found where um, uh, Shahnameh is, uh, some elements of Shahnameh, that the, the Rustam incident is being illustrated on one side while Lazutanissa is happening on the other. Um, having And those have their own set of meanings that I could go on and go on about. Uh, but the 10 odd copies that I can say that I found, which are heavily illustrated, also have a subcategory um, in the sense that um, some of them are actually, uh, again, going back to how Lazatunisa is a genre and not a text. Uh, some of them are uh, writing the same information that is in other Lazatunisa in form of a hikayat. So instead of, you know, and each hikayat has a, um, or, or a story has a, uh, manus is a has a illustration uh, which corresponds to it. So those are one type um, of illustrated manuscripts that I found, and the methodology there that I used was to read those hikayats in conjunction with those paintings. Usually, what I found is that the, there are paintings heavily uh, sort of explicit, but um, or what we consider explicit, but those are. Uh, disconnected with the text they are not nothing that's happening so not the medical bits are still going on and then there's a couple copulating so um, they necessarily don't have anything um, to tie them together and yet they're on the same subject so there's a range of possibilities that are happening with the visual material that is included in the illustrated copies um, and each has a specific purpose. Um, some of these, of course, as I've said in my talk, um, these medical manuals are even telling you to look at uh, people sexually copulating. So uh, as a cure, so it could have served that function. It could have ser served, well, who knows, educational purposes. Um, and, uh, you know, or even cautionary tales. Some of the hikayats I found actually go on to tell you that, well, do not engage in this particular sort of permutation and combination because uh, of sexual activity because this is harmful for the man and harmful for the women as well so so yeah that's. thank you uh, and also i think this is the last question we have on the on the q and a box but if you have any more questions please do post them uh, in the meantime, uh, if I can take the liberty of asking a question, uh, sort of building on uh, Shanak's question. Um, so my question is, sorry, uh, what is the, uh, so since you're reading so many different genres of texts against each other, right? And you're, um, uh, and you're sort of like, I'm just trying to imagine what your archival experience must have been like. <laughs> uh, given that archival catalogs in across South Asia and the UK categorize manuscripts separately, right? Um, what was your methodology in deciding what primary sources you, you wanted to look for in pursuit of your broader dissertation on sexuality in Mughal India? Um, thank you for that question. I think um, my methodology was hit and miss and then learn from your mistake. Um, so um, in the UK, we've, we're given, I mean, I uh, we're given three years and I took another one year and then pandemic gave me whatever, uh, another year, uh, we're given a specific amount of time. So the first time, I, I'm extremely grateful to my supervisor, Professor Nandini Chatterjee and Sarah Tulalan, that they equipped me, of course, when I was going into the archive, um, with the knowledge, to, especially Nandini, where she said, don't look at um, the just go into a catalog. And, uh, and the first one I did was British Library, and just read through certain sections don't look for sex look look at what the descriptions are and so the first level that happened of course is that when i went and looked at catalogs um, and then obviously i took that forward uh, was that once i stopped looking at um, irritology or sex as a keyword and i started looking at desire medicine um, you know, all sorts of love, um, these outlier kind of things, I found a lot of material that I wouldn't have if I was only looking for specific terms and specific keywords. And while specific keywords and terms can help you when you're first going into these incredible archives, large archives, it is always helpful to not, you know, get caught up in these categories that are, that are obviously 
created in 19th century or 18th century and had that you know baggage that the cataloger is bringing to the archive as well um and the second thing that i that that i only discovered uh, unfortunately towards the end of my sort of field work was this incredibly rich 18th century material which was anonymous miscellaneous and had been relegated to supplementary sections uh, where nobody i i don't know nobody wanted to see them so these these were bayazes these were khirkas these were nuskhajats these were just un- unnamed texts i have in my dissertation used texts which are unnamed anonymous 18th century and i would like to thank pro- uh, professor chandrashekar and sakib babri uh, dr sakib babri who sat down and looked at some of these material and helped me understand if it was 18th century 19th century if what was happening why were they all clubbed together and in terms of sort of spatially i um the the nature of sort of again the uk phd was that i was fortunate that i could have looked at the british library archive welcome archive was very very helpful and i cannot encourage um enough uh, to pe- for people to just go there and look at do not think that it's only medicine it's so much more than medicine they have such amazing texts um and of course bodleian salarjung jamia hamdard again cannot cannot insist on how great that that archive is so in terms of sort of my archival experience these are the places that i that i found most of my material in sonia thank you i think uh, that last bit was really helpful for people like us graduate students who who are working with catalogs made in the 18th 19th century so i really thank you for bringing that up uh, i do want to ask you maybe as a um, just to sum this whole discussion up uh, and to give you a space to also have closing thoughts down where is the field of early modern medicine now it's a big question i know uh, but i want to ask you maybe um where do you see it going in the future or what else would you you've mentioned things you would like to do but also want to see happening in the field i mean it's a i'm taking off from uh, anurag's question itself but i feel it's an emerging one and we'd like to have someone like you show us some way forward if you can uh, thank you i think um i mean i i think um at the moment the field i would say um has very few people working on it to be very honest i think there are big names like sima alvi fabrizio spezzale they, they these have they've shown us the first methodology of how to deal with these texts of course and then there are contemporaries and peers and 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 people who are like debra and shireen and shireen hamza and and anurag and and and, and so many others who who have now started taking up medical sources as as a legitimate you know source base for um for uh, for for research on uh, the early modern but i think at the most basic level i think um we don't have translations we um so so you know it would be helpful to i'm not even okay i am actually not even going to go to translations we don't have edited volumes and it is not the easiest the way we are taught um i mean the way that i was taught language um it was as a pedagogical tool but also you know as a language of translation um and and armed with that when you go into the archive of course medis- medical archives are a daunting daunting task um you know terms etc etc so um technical terms and to understand those so what we actually do need um and uh, is people who work on fleshing out these bits uh people who do, who have to do hard work of translating for people who don't have these languages i one doesn't necessarily have to learn persian or one necessarily shouldn't have to learn persian to be able to do this the work that we hope to do and i think that is where i i want i would wish or i would project to the universe that the field should go towards translations towards people working on niche topics or people working on topics that that are not niche that are that are very simple but from medical sources um so that this can become 
a, a, a valid source base or genre of historical research of early modern South Asia. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for saying this. I, I, as someone who's not so uh, well versed with the medical archive, I think this has, I, I think I can speak for myself and a few others that this has been very, very insightful. I thank you and our participants for making this such an in, insightful event. It's been a brilliant start to my day here, I must say. Uh, I really appreciate you for choosing this, the platform that ISIS gives for sharing your pathbreaking research with us. It's been a lot of food for thought. And again, I want to thank our highly engaged audience of, and ISAS for making this such a fruitful discussion. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, thank you, Prajita. And, uh, and any remaining questions that you have, uh, I think we answered everything in the Q&A box, but if there's anything else, it will be, all the questions will be shared with the speaker at the end of the event, and a recording will be available on the Institute's website soon. And I also want to join up, Prajita, in thanking our co-sponsors, the Institute for South Asia Studies, the Center on Contemporary India, and the Sarah Kailath Chair of India Studies. So... <laughs> Thank you. I'd, thank I'd you. like to add my thank yous as well. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.